Everybody, this is the Growing Boulder Radio Show. I'm Bill Schaefer. Mark Middleton is here, and today, are we ever thrilled to have two of our favorite people, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Roger McGuinn and his wife Camilla, both with us right here in the studio. And Mark, the best news about that, I think Roger brought a guitar. Oh, he's got the Roger McGuinn uh, Martin signature, and he's playing. Mark. You sound great on yeah. guitar. <laughs> And the in there. We go from my back pages, uh, which is, by the way, folks, the new theme song of the Growing Boulder Radio Show. And Roger, thank you to that to, to, for that. Roger singing it live. My pleasure. Yeah, that's great. You know, it, it's it's always fun to have you guys with us because you're two so interesting people and have so many different things that you're into. There's uh, no shortage of stuff we can talk about. And before we get into that, let's just bring everybody up to date on what's been happening in your lives because we follow you regularly through Camilla's blog. Right. It's been a fabulous year uh, on tour, playing all over the world, really. Yes, all over the world. Well, let's see. Last year, we spent two months in Europe, right? Yes. Yeah. And then uh, we got back and did some dates in the States. And then I got this invitation to play uh, at Macworld. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, uh, invited me, and I was all excited. So I went to Camilla, and I said, hey, you know, Leo Laporte invited me to be at Macworld. And she said, well, I can fly you out there on frequent flyer points. I said, nah, that's no fun. I want you to come, too. Ten minutes later, we got an email from our agent who books on cruises on uh, ocean liners. And what did he say, Camilla? He says, "Uh, we know it's late, but would you be interested in going from New York to San Francisco in January? On the Queen Victoria. Through the Panama Canal. The maiden voyage of the Queen Victoria to San Francisco. Roger doesn't do shows there. He does lectures. And the lectures are... um, it's how folk music got him to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's kind of a bio. It's <laughs> like a, a biography, and it's a lot of fun. But so I did that. We, we uh, t- went through the Panama Canal. We, we got to San Francisco, and we were there just a little bit early, so we rented a condo in Knob Hill for a couple of weeks and took the cable cars. And, you know, the greatest thing about being over 65 is that you can get um, a, barred pa- a cable car pass in San Francisco for $15. A and month. For a month. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 looking at uh, Camilla's blog, you guys obviously had a ton of fun. And, and, and I should mention that the reviews that, that, that you are getting for your concerts are, are, are just unbelievably enthusiastic. Uh, one of the recent reviews after a performance in New Jersey, and I, and I only want to read this because it really does sum up who you are. Uh, now I know why Petty and Springsteen are such huge fans of Roger. The Rickenbacker 12 created a supersonic dreamscape. Roger's stories are hilarious. Hilarious. His voice is fantastic. He did three, count them, three encores. You must see and hear this essential chapter of American music. Roger McGuinn, musician, inventor, genius, entertainer. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's a little, little heavy-handed. He's, <laughs> he's also very humble. But 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 your storytelling is a part of your act. And I know you mentioned the Queen Victoria. You you are playing on cruise ships now, and and and, and your concerts in a way become lectures, don't they? Yes, they do. And uh, I have to thank you for turning me on to Keynote, the software for my MacBook Pro, because I use that with a uh, presentation. Oh, yeah, and I, I've got Eartha Kitt in there and the Chad Mitchell Trio when I was 19. I'm playing on the Bell Telephone Hour and a lot of things that I, I sort of gleaned off of YouTube and stuck up in my in my Keynote uh, um, presentation. And it's really, it really adds to the whole thing. And I'm using the Keynote. is so great. It's got all these things where you can do like uh, flip things around and turn them over. Yeah, transitions, right. And some of the other lecturers were in the audience taking notes after I had done my thing and said, how did you do that? You know, it's like, well, because they were using uh, some, some sort of PC software that didn't do all those <laughs> tricks, you know. <laughs> Maybe it was an older version or something like that, but it was really fun. And I'm, I'm, I love doing it. It's really a kick. And I do it at colleges, too. 
It's, it's a lot of fun to do lectures at colleges. You are in many ways the, the history of American music because you, growing up in Chicago, I mean, you first got hooked on uh, your transistor radio when you, when you heard what? I, well, first of all, I got a transistor radio, which was a game changer. It was the iPod of its day. It, it, was, it was what let kids listen to rock and roll surreptitiously with the earphone because a lot of parents didn't really encourage their kids to listen to rock and roll but I was riding around Chicago with my transistor radio it was a, a Regency TR1 <laughs> and tuned into WJJD which was the rock and roll station at the time and I heard well since my baby left me well I found a new place to dwell well it's down at the end of the lonely street that's my pretty hotel well I will be I'll be there so lonely baby I'll be there so lonely I'll be so lonely I could die. And I loved it. There was something about that. I'd never heard, well, I really hadn't never heard blues before. And he was putting blues and, and uh, pop music together in such a way that they called it rockabilly, but I'd never heard anything like it. And it made me want to play music. What did, what did your parents think of that, Roger? Well, you know, many of us, as we grew up, our parents said, oh, no, and there was a pushback that made us want to do it even more. I think you're right, because my parents did not like Elvis Presley. They, they thought he was kind of sleazy and, and scary, uh, he, even though, you know, he wore a, a jacket and, and nice clothes and everything. I guess it was uh, the body language that turned him off. But, yeah, they were a little bit frightened by Elvis, and uh, it made me want to do it more. Hmm. So, so you got a guitar, and before too long, you were enrolled in, in a, a very prominent school for folk music. Right. Well, at my high school, the Latin School of Chicago, the music teacher invited a folk singer named Bob Gibson to come over. And he came over and, and played a set of uh, really beautiful folk songs and told stories. And I was captivated by it. It was something different from what Elvis had done, but it was just as, it made me want to do it as much as listening to Elvis. So I went to the Old Town School of Folk Music, and I learned how to pick the, the first the six-string guitar, and then I went down and got a 12-string guitar, and then I got a five-string banjo and got into all of those instruments, and mandolin, too. And, and before you knew it, somehow you were playing with uh, the Chad Mitchell Trio, uh, working for Bobby Darren. Right. Well, there was an intermediate step. I, I got a job at a coffee house, and after the coffee house gig, I'd go down to the Gate of Horn, where all the big time folk singers played. And this one night, there was a jam session with Theodore Bikel, remember the actor, uh, folk singer, and two of the Limelighters, Alex Hosselov and Glenn Yarbrough, and they were all playing guitars. And I walked in with my banjo, and they said, "Break out the banjo. We got too many guitars going." <laughs> so I did, and I played till five o'clock in the morning, which is pretty late, but it's when they close the uh, the bars on Saturday night in Chicago. And that's when Alex Hossel of, of the Limelighters invited me to be part of the group. And I auditioned for him the next day, and they said, great, you got the job. When can you start? And I kind of sheepishly said, well, I get out of high school in June. <laughs> you know, uh, when we listen to Bob Dylan tell his story, he talks a lot about the quest to figure out what made Woody Guthrie click is what helped him form his sound, his his passion in music. Did you have a, a similar thing? Was there someone whose who's music captivated you and, and helped you decide what kind of musician you were? Well, my early influences were Bob Gibson, the guy who came to the high school. He was an excellent musician, a uh, great storyteller. Uh, and then he, because of his influence, I went to the Old Town School and I learned about Pete Seeger. And he was the guy who had influenced Bob Gibson. So I, I saw where it all came from. And Seeger became the, the guy I was following from then on. He, his value system and his sense of um, like moral justice and all that were things that I liked. And I loved his music. I loved his singing. And I loved his playing. He, he was a very dedicated musician, very intricate. I mean, he would do... Uh <laughs> very pretty little uh, picking things. He did a whole thing called the goofing off suite of, of things like that, and it was really fun. And Seeger was all about not having to be the most talented musician in the world. He was about sharing his music in a participatory way with people. Yes, he was just plain folks, and he invited the audience to be folks with him, and we were all just, when I'd go to the concerts, we were all just a bunch of folks singing, mm. and it was great fun. 
We are talking with Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Roger McGuinn and his wife Camilla. And uh, we're not really racing ahead to 1964, but we want to get there pretty quickly because that's uh, when you founded the Birds and it got pretty exciting. But uh, after Chicago and, and the Limelighters, you, you did wander to New York, right? And, and, and played in some coffee houses there for a while. I did. I, I worked um, with the Chad Mitchell Trio for a couple of years, and then Bobby Darren hired me away from them, and he opened up a publishing company in the Brill Building, and I moved to New York to be a songwriter. And the assignment was to listen to the radio and write songs like the ones out there. And the Beatles came out at that point, and they just, when I heard this, uh, because we use this folk music, uh, these chords in folk music, and when I heard that the Beatles doing this, that they... I went, hey, they're doing folk music chords. Ah. And it gave me the idea to take old folk songs down to the village and play folk songs with a Beatle beat. So that was how I got into doing what I did later. Always a very creative force in music, an inventor, and uh, described by many as being a genius. That led you to to Los Angeles. Uh, you were playing uh, at a club called the Troubadour, uh, and somehow you got hooked up with Chris Hillman. How did that happen? Well, the first guy I met was Gene Clark, and the reason he came backstage was because I was doing folk songs with this Beatle beat, and it was not going over very well for the general audience because folk music and rock and roll didn't mix. They were kind of like oil and water. (laughs) 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 And uh, But one guy liked it, and his name was Gene Clark, and he came backstage and said, let's write some songs together. Maybe we'll form a duo or something. So Gene Clark and I started writing, and one of the first songs we wrote was you showed me how to do exactly what you do how i fell in love with you oh 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 it's true i'm in love with you later picked up by a group called the turtles and they made i think a top 10 hit out of it flo and eddie just took it right from under you huh well it was uh rejected by the birds management they didn't think it was any good you know, just one of the amazing stories, the backstories that you never get to hear. As you started making this progression and starting to gain popularity, Roger, were you, it was such a tumultuous time. Was the social activism, was the awakening that was going on in that generation, was that a motivator for you, or was it strictly always about the music? For me, it was pretty much about the music, although I, I went along with the, you know, when we wrote songs about the um, the. Vietnam War, like Draft Morning, and we wrote anti-drug songs. We wrote we wrote a lot of political songs, but that wasn't our main focus. I think it was more melodies and harmonies and and beats and trying to keep a beat. Yeah, it's it's really something to to look back and see where the the inspiration turned into expectation in, in a lot of the groups of that era. Uh, people were looking for something to grab onto. They were, we were almost lost, weren't we? And, and looking for to, to either put up a Dylan or to put up the birds and say yes. This is who we are. I think Turn, Turn, Turn was a hit because it had a a sound of hope, a time for peace. I swear it's not too late at the end of it. And it was just a wonderful song Pete Seeger wrote and we put a Beatle beat to. All right, Roger, we're going to have to take a break here in a moment. But as we do, we're just about in 1964 now. Gene Clark and you are jamming at the Troubadour. A guy named David Crosby wanders up, adds some vocals. And before you know it, uh, somebody from Bob Dylan's camp presents you with a little bit of a tune uh, that became the Bird's first hit. As we go to break, can you give us just a little taste of what that is? Well, here's what it sounded like when we first heard it. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. I'm not sleepy and there is no place I'm going to. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. In the jingle jangle morning I'll come following you. And in just a minute, we will hear what Roger turned that song into that made it a classic. Okay, good segment. Beautiful. Beautiful. Very nice. So good. Okay, good. I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. 